Good morning, good to be with you this morning. We'll make your way over to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2. And as you turn there, I just want to remind you that uh, we'll be putting these sermons back up on our webpage, and also you can catch us at YouTube. Uh, you can put in Doty Springs, and they uh, usually pull up a picture of me, and I always seem to be doing something terrible like uh, that. But anyway, if you'll get it going, it'll, it'll, it'll do something for you there. Also, you can uh, send your offerings in. You can find there on our, on our page there, the address uh, to send any tithes and offerings, any other support you'd like to lend our church during this time. So we'll be grateful for that. If you found your uh, way over to Ezekiel chapter 2, say amen. amen. Let's read together. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. And the Spirit entered me, and when he spoke to me and set me on my feet, I heard him who spoke to me. And he said, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transpassed against me to this very day. For they are impudent and stubborn children, and I am sending you to them. And you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, Though briars and thorns are with you and you dwell among the scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. I shall speak my words to them, whether you or they hear or they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you, and do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give to you. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book uh, was written in it. And he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside. Writing on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Let's pray. Dear Father, we do ask you to watch over those people today, Lord, who are not able to be with us, Lord, those families who have uh, uh, suffered loss through this time in crisis, Lord. I ask especially for Miss um, Jean, Lord, and Cool and her family, Lord, the, the great blessing and comfort that you know what's going on and you know what's happening, Lord, and uh, that you'll safely uh, take care of Miss Thelma in, in, uh, in the years and, and everlasting to come. Lord, we do pray also, Lord, uh, that you would add your blessing to the reading of your word, and may you be glorified today. In Jesus' name I pray. We have before us a very ambitious project. See the first three chapters, 1, 2, and 3 of Ezekiel, is actually the calling of the prophet Ezekiel. And when we begin to look at it, we have a, a, a few different components of that. And we have to look back to chapter 1 to really get to us to chapter 2. Uh, the book of Romans, Romans 15, 4, and we talked about this a little bit Wednesday night, says to us, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning. 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 says, Now all these happened to them uh, were examples that they were written for us for our instruction. So when we look back in the Old Testament, we know that God has a purpose for them. He was uh, truly dealing in their lives. And if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and God is an unchanging God, the same way He was dealing with problems in the Old Testament, it, uh, whether on a national level, or on a world level, or on a personal level, that's the same way he's dealing with and taking care of problems for us. He has a plan, a purpose. And when he calls Ezekiel, by the way, God, Ezekiel's name means God strengthens, we find Ezekiel uh, by a, a large canal there in Babylon. If you remember our, our study in Daniel that uh, when the Babylonians came, uh, they took out at least three different uh, groups of, of captives. And uh, Daniel was among the first, and Ezekiel probably was either in the first or the second. And they situated them in this place, according to chapter 3, uh, a place called uh, Tel Aviv. And uh, that word Tel means a, a mound of ruin. So they obviously, just thinking out loud here, 
brought the children of Israel, the, the Judean captives, to a place outside of the capital city of Babylon, and they put them beside this great irrigation canal that stretched from one side of the Euphrates and made a big a curve around and in through Babylon and out to the other side, uh, and he ended up at the Ur of Chaldees. This is where Abraham came. These are real places in Mesopotamia. And this place had been a, a place of ruin, and they put the Judean captivity, uh, captives in there to, to maybe rebuild or to, to toil the ground or, or however that worked. That's where he was, somewhere around that area. And he was about 30 years old. Now, we look in the Bible, we find out that that uh, in Numbers 4, 1 through 3, that 30 years old was the age when, when the priests were to enter into service. It was a, they were to serve from the 30th year to their 50th year. And, uh, and Ezekiel identifies himself as a priest. And uh, while he was a contemporary of Jeremiah, remember Jeremiah had taken for the last 40 years and told them that they were going into captivity. Now, Ezekiel was coming of age in captivity, there in the fifth year, he'd been there, and he was coming of age to become a priest, but instead of becoming a priest, God had called him to be a prophet. God always has his purpose and his plan. Jeremiah was a weeping prophet. Ezekiel would be a prophet of, of, of both of, uh, judgment and encouragement. As a matter of fact, uh, chapter 3, verse 9 says that he would make his head like adamant stone, harder than flint. Uh, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them or be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. We had a conversation recently uh, about people being hard-headed, and obviously God puts hard-headed people in each other's way because that's what it takes to deal with one another. So here he was going to be a different kind of prophet, and it would have been great if he could have remained a priest. It would have been much easier... Uh, they had a, a high esteem if you were a priest and, and uh, the Jews. And a priest could read uh, the law and uh, learn everything he needed to do about his work. Prophets uh, were usually despised and persecuted. They received the, their messages and orders directed from God on occasion. Uh, uh, they demanded uh, they could never be sure what would happen next. It was dangerous being a prophet. Most people resented being told about their sins and preferred a message of cheer. So here he was getting ready to go in something that was respectable, and God calls him out and says, no, no, you're going to go into something else that I need. And when we begin to look at what Ezekiel sees, we see that in this first chapter he begins to see a vision. That's often how God does it for these people in the Old Testament. He wants them to get an understanding of who he is before they go into their calling. Uh, there may have been a misconception that, uh, that God was something else. So uh, he takes his first chapter and begins to explain for himself who he really is, that is, God really is in the, in the place and purpose of this time. See, if we see God clearly, it allows us to see everything else rightly. If we can really get a true vision of who God is, it allows us to see what's really going on around us and even inside of us. We begin to get an understanding even of ourselves. In Ezekiel, every bit of judgment, every ray of hope has a purpose of redirecting God toward his people. These were people who had forgotten. Again, you saw, I read over and over again, at least seven times that they were a rebellious people. Matter of fact, he calls them a, a rebellious nation. Everywhere else in the Bible, you'll find Israel contrasted against the nations, right? The nations were always the Gentiles. Uh, the, the, the Israelites were always the children of God. There was a great contrast. And here, now God has lumped them, this rebellious nation of, of Judah, in with the Gentiles so that God doesn't see them apart anymore. And uh, so they're running into problems. And what the real problem was in that day is that Jeremiah had prophesied that they would spend 70 years in captivity. Now, they had been there some five or six years. And false prophets had begun to arise and begin to give them false hope and begin to bring false messages. They thought that maybe the northern kingdom or some remnant of, of the Jews would come in and rescue them. They often were told that people from Egypt would come in and rescue them because Nebuchadnezzar and the Egyptians had fought a 
a great battle and Nebuchadnezzar won, but they kept saying that Egypt was going to, to, to re, remantle itself, remast itself, and, and go in and, and destroy Babylon, that help would come there. But Jeremiah had told them to settle in, make themselves part of the society, uh, plant uh, crops and uh, build businesses, because they were going to be there a while. And God wanted to assure them that his message of 70 years was true. And it, the reason they were there 70 years is because they kept breaking the Sabbath. And six years they were supposed to do the work, and in the seventh year they were supposed to let the land rest for it. They did that for 490 years, and God says, you know what, I'm going to, let the, I'm going to get my rest. So it sends them into captivity for 70 years to let the land rest. You'll see here in, in uh, verse 3 of chapter 1 that the Bible says the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. Notice that God takes the initiative. If God wants you to know him, he takes the initiative. He gets your attention. Like Moses at the burning bush or Isaiah at the temple or Paul on the road to Damascus, God is always the one who does the calling. God's always the one who has the purpose. And we begin to see uh, things like uh, uh, a great fire coming from the north, and the north is always associated both with trouble and with God's throne. God's throne is Isaiah 14, 1, and Psalms uh, 75, uh, 5 through 7. And you'll notice over and over again in chapter 1, when you get a chance to go back and read, he used the word appearance and likeness and life. Here's a man who is trying to explain to us what he sees as that no one has seen before and uh, no one has really seen since. And when they were able to see it, Paul says he was lifted up into the third heaven and he was, he was unable to utter the things that were before him because there were just words, words failed him. So he, he tries to liken what he sees uh, to what he has. And he talks about uh, these uh, four creatures and they each had four faces and they all had... Uh, six wings and they would cover their body with one set and they would uh, uh, fly with one set and they would touch each other's wings with the other set. And when you begin to look at how we're talking here, these four uh, cherubim make, if you will, a square. And then it begins to talk about wheels inside of wheels. And we find that these wheels on the rims of them had eyes on them and uh, they were associated closely with these cherubim. So when we begin to think about what we're seeing here, we're seeing a box with wheels on it. We're seeing what, Abraham, uh, what Ezekiel sees is a chariot of God. And he talks about how they're able to move without turning. And how they go where the Spirit wills them to go and they move with lightning. And what uh, Ezekiel is, is seeing here is that God... Uh, a great firmament, a beautiful platform, and he sees a throne, and he sees one, uh, 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 an appearance of a man with a blazing image up top and a burning fire uh, down below, and, and uh, it's just a, a, an image that's uh, burned into him so significantly that in uh, the last verse of chapter 1, he says, So I saw it, and I fell on my face. That's a, that's a life-changing vision. By the way, in the Old Testament, that's often what happened when people saw the Lord. That's when, when people say, well, I've seen him, and they still stand up. I don't believe him. I don't think you can stand in the presence of the Almighty. I just don't think so. That's why I think every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. It pulls out of us how, how great and glorious it is. And those, those four cherubim are there to keep sinful man from even coming anywhere close to approaching the glory of God. And again, how he moves, right? Just a will and never turning. And, and what that signifies is, is that God has a plan and God has a purpose and there's nothing that gets in his way. They don't move for mountains, they go through them. They don't move for wars, they go through them. They don't move because of desires, they go through them. Wherever God is, he is in total control. And what God is trying to get Ezekiel to do is to understand that he's not some small guy. <coughs> Many of Ezekiel's countrymen, these Judean exiles, probably had the same assumption about God's as all the other neighbors around. 
that their gods were very territorial and that uh, uh, that's all they did. Uh, and if the Babylonian god Baal was better than the Philistine god Dagon, then the Baals would, uh, would allow the Babylonians to prosper over the god there of Philistine or the god there of Judah or the god there of, of Egypt. But that's not how it works. This God that we're talking about here, this God that he sees has no jurisdiction. This God does whatever he wants to. He has a different kind of jurisdiction. One God, one God that is trapped in the earth and is in control of all of it. His superiority uh, that Ezekiel is allowed to see in chapter 1 might just bring hope to this terrible situation. The lesson in chapter 1, summarizing it very quickly, is that no matter how discouraging the circumstance, God was still on his throne and accomplishing his divine purposes in this will. What's the lesson for us today? There is still a God on his throne and his purposes are being accomplished. No matter who's burning what, no matter who's tearing what down, no matter what words are coming from your television, no matter how you feel overwhelmed, no matter what kind of income situations that you have, there is still a God on his throne. And this God on his throne did not send uh, uh, Israel into captivity because he was weaker than some other God. He sent them into captivity. They were seeing these troubles because of the sin that was being committed. And he was passing real judgment on their sinfulness. Oftentimes it's been said that most uh, people get the government that they deserve, right? So when we begin to, to look at the weakness and, and the, the inability to have any lawfulness in our country these days, we, we probably have voted and we probably have allowed that to happen because uh, we have been weak ourselves and we don't want anybody holding up any high standards for us so we don't have any high standards for anyone else. And, and when that happens, we see that uh, we all have a race to the bottom of the barrel. So in chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he says to him, after he shows him the vision, then he commissions him for the work. After he gets the understanding that God is able and that God has not been defeated and God's purposes have not been forwarded and God's purposes have, have not been uh, misaligned, after he sees that God is undeterred and how he moves and that God can move across this this earth with the speed of light itself and the speed of thought and he's overseeing and, and full control of it all and all the stones that are mentioned and all the fire that is mentioned and all the wind that is mentioned shows the mightiness of it that he has. After he sees all this, he says to him, son of man, that is the son of Adam, right? This is a, a, a name that Jesus would call himself in the New Testament some 86 times. It identified him with his humanity. So he says, Son of man, you, you human, I'm talking to you in the supernatural. You are different than I am different. We are not the same. I am your God. You are my servant. I think if we get a lot of that in, in mind, remember that the word Adam even comes from the word dirt, right? He's taken from the ground. So he's a ground man. God say, I'm identifying you with, with what you are, just, a, just a, the dirt of this earth. Nothing bad, it's just that God's putting us in perspective. Sometimes, again, seeing God clearly puts us in the right mind of seeing ourselves rightly. Right? We need to understand that we're not at all. We need to understand that we're, we're not the end all, be all. There's a lot of people in this world, and you can see them on your television, and you can see them, hear them on your radios, and you can see them in any other media platform that think they're the end all, the be all. But I'm telling you what, there is one who is over all. And we need to understand where we fall. We fall way below him. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are, are higher than our thoughts. Our righteousness, the best that, that any of us can do, the book of, uh, of Jeremiah tells us that our righteousness is nothing more than filthy rags before him. So putting him in perspective, Stand on your feet and I will speak to you. And then the Spirit entered me, right? In the Old Testament, that Spirit did not indwell him. 
on occasions the spirit would be placed inside of the person for a special time, for a special reason. But now because of the blood and sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we have the, the comforter inside of us. But back then he had to enter. And notice how that works, right? God's word and then God's hand. God's word encourages us and enlightens us. God's hand enables us. They go uh, hand in hand. God's enlightenment in his word and God's hand in our enablement. So he comes and he says, Son of man, I'm sending you to a children of Israel, a rebellious nation. Again, identifying him with the Gentiles, identifying them with the Gentiles, that has rebelled against me and that fathers had trans uh, uh, transgressed against me to this very day. Again, they did not go into captivity. They were not under this judgment because God got whooped by anybody, right? They went into this captivity. They are under this judgment because of the sin that had been going on generation after generation. A lot of times we look at our, our own selves today and wonder what kind of mess we're in. Well, we need to look what kind of mess we come from. Or what kind of mess we're fixing to head into. The Bible talks to us and begins to, to outline things as an abomination or wicked or, or evil. And man says nothing's wrong with him. I want you to know what? God has not changed his opinion when he calls something an abomination, something wicked, or something evil. Just because somebody else said it was all right, God hadn't put his seal of approval on it. So when we look around at the situation that we're in in our lives, understanding God is gracious, God is patient, God is merciful, God is long-suffering, all of those things, there comes a payday in your life. This happened to be that payday for them. And we understand what the payday for sin is. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. You're exactly right. For they are impotent. Now, my Bible gives me my center call of reference, a little more literal trans. Relation of that, it says, stiff faced and hard hearted sons. And he says, I'm sending you to them, and you shall say, Thus saith the Lord God. He identifies him as Adonai uh, Yahweh, that is, uh, the Lord God of strength. It has both his, his glory and both his covenant keeping name together. God's going to get his glory. And in the meantime, he's going to keep his covenant. He has promised these people that he would have someone on the throne of David forever. He has promised them that they one day would uh, have an everlasting promised land. And he's going to keep his promise for them in Yahweh. But Adonai is almighty, and he's going to do it his way. Remember, he's of pure eyes to behold iniquity. Remember those cherubim stand around him. And you can find those same four living creatures in the book of Revelation. They stand around him. Uh, keeping sinful man or any sin from approaching or bringing reproach to the throne of God. They're there. His uh, beast of burden, if you will, to make sure that he doesn't have to have to even uh, uh, look at sin. So it comes to him and says, ask for whether they hear or whether they refuse. That word hear, they're all going to hear, right? We're all hearing me this morning. Anybody can't hear me this morning? No hands are raised. Everybody's hearing me. The problem is not if they hear, but if they heed. The problem is not if they hear, but if they heed. Right? Whether they hear or whether they refuse, are, are they going to listen? Remember when Jesus says, He that has uh, the Spirit, uh, uh, ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Remember? Everybody's hearing, but are you hearing by the power of the Spirit? Are you heeding what He's actually saying? He's going to say a lot to him. Isaiah is a very long book and it tells a, a lot of detail and at least five more visions. And, and Isaiah has to, uh, Ezekiel has to lay on his side for 428 days and then he has to act like he's under siege and, and then he, he loses a wife and, and Ezekiel becomes a, a very picture of what God's got going on for these people while they're in exile. And how they have no hope of getting out of it to the 70 years have passed. And he will become a, a, a laughing stock to them. And, 
And yet in the end, he speaks of, of glory and restoration. He's the one that talks about the, the valley of the dry bones. Will these dry bones live again? And Ezekiel says, you say, Lord. This is that guy who says those things. And God causes those dry bones to stand up and makes a mighty army out of them and breathes his life into them again. And they begin to march. That's his nation of Israel rising up out of this captivity. That is the nation of Israel going back and claiming the promised land. That's the nation of Israel having an eternal home. My friends, that same God who raises those dry bones are asking us this very morning to heed what He saved. What does He need in this time? He needs His folks to shine like lights. He needs us to be stars in a perverse, dark world. He needs us to get it together. He needs us to begin to understand that the things that are happening around us have, have nothing to do with, with upsetting His plans or, or delaying His purpose. His plans, His purposes have always been that every man, woman, and child should not perish, but all should come to repentance. He's all about sending the gospel out with power. He's all about the gospel changing us from the inside of out. He's all about getting the character of Christ uh, shining forth out of us. That's His plan. That's His purpose. All these other nations have risen and fallen all these many years. Things have come and gone. Pestilence and disease and Tornadoes and north earthquakes and storms and fires and, and tribulations have, have come and they'll, they'll greatly increase as that time gets closer. And yet his goal, his purpose to seal the same, to have the gospel go out, the good news go out of his changed and redeemed people that others might come to know him so that we don't have to live in hell. And our friends and family don't have to live in hell. We may have an abode of heaven with Maybe that the repentance is needed in our lives. Maybe we need to get back on track of ourselves. Maybe we should understand God's vision of that heavenly chariot with that beautiful platform with that throne setting up there with a man above it, again all in chapter 1, and, and begin to see that there's a great vision of God. He wants to see you see that. That burning bush that Moses went through, and as he turns aside to look at it, He's, he's cautioned that he needs to take his shoes off because he's standing on holy ground. That, that train is uh, uh, filling the temple in Isaiah chapter 6 so that Isaiah can get an understanding that, that uh, God was everywhere and, and had uh, full control of what was going on. Paul, on his way to the road uh, to, uh, to Damascus to put people in jail, the light comes down on top of him, has a changing vision of the who Christ is and what Christ won't be on. From somebody who was a murderer and somebody who was an accuser of the brother to somebody who, who was able to uplift and, and encourage people all these many generations before because God changed them. If God has changed us, we should have a, an errant change in our life, a real change of direction, a 180 degree turn. And it doesn't matter whether they listen to us or not. What matters is we've told them what thus saith the Lord God is. We're afraid to call sin a sin because we won't, don't want to upset anybody. We don't want to lose our jobs. We don't want people to hold us to the same standard. Our Bibles tell us that God remembers our frames that what it does. God knows who we are. We're all just dirt men and dirt women. God's Spirit indwells us. God's Word enlightens us. And God's hand enables us. So what is the purpose? Ask for them whether they hear or whether they refuse. Verse 5. For they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. What was the purpose of God? To change His people and let Him know let them know that he still cared for them in captivity, that he would tell them how to make it through it. And he says, You, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor afraid of their words. Uh, the briars and thorns are, are with you if they push you out into the wilderness, right? You're dwelling with scorpions. Who does that remind us of in the New Testament? Who stayed out in the wilderness? John the Baptist, Jess. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed at their looks. 
though they are a rebellious house, people are going to talk about you, people are going to look at you funny. Why? Because they don't want to be judged for their sin. They don't want to be reminded that they've sinned. They don't mind that there's a better blessing for them. He says, you shall speak my words to them where they hear or where they refuse men. The, 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 the heeding is, is their part. The speaking is your part. The heeding is on them. You can get all in that in chapter 3. For they are rebellious. Again, I'm, I'm telling you who I'm sending you to. I'm telling you the world you're living in right now is a rebellious world. Anybody? It's a rebellious world. No different, really. These people don't want to hear. The people we're around don't want to hear. They don't want to change. They want to grumble. They want to cry. They want to pull down. They want to diminish the system. They want to overtake the government. They want to put you under their thumb. But they don't want to change. But you, son of man, hear what I say, right? Don't be like them. You heed what I'm saying. You heed it. You get it right. See, you don't have to worry about everybody else. You have responsible primarily for yourself. Now, you'd like to be responsible for your family, right? I get up and go to work, and, and I come home, and even the dog knows that I have to leave the house and bring home something to eat, right? He looks at me when I get up to leave, and... He's laying in the bed with Diane. He kind of lifts up his head and says, you go get it to pay. And I'll be waiting on you when you get home. And don't forget, I need some more treats. Right? right? I'd like to be able to take care of everybody, right? Sometimes I feel like all I am is a paycheck. Anybody? I mean, that's all I feel like sometimes. But I, I want to provide. I want to do right. But ultimately, ultimately, spiritually speaking, I'm just responsible for myself. I can tell my wife about Jesus. I can try to live before her a holy life. But it's on her if she heeds or not. What's important is if I heed it or not. I can live before my children what I think is the best life a father can live. I can give them all the gifts like a good father would give them. I can be there for them every moment of the, uh, and, and, and soothe all the boo-boos and, and push all the tree limbs out of the way for them. Uh, do my very best. But what's ultimately What's ultimately their responsibility is if they heed him what the Word of God did. So if somebody dies and go to hell, ultimately it's on them. He says, contrasting, well, they're rebellious. You don't be rebellious. They may not hear, but you hear. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. What's he going to give you? He looks there and says, I looked and there was a, a hand outstretched to me and behold, a scroll of a book was written in it. Now remember these scrolls were usually written on just one side and rolled up. So something significant here in verse 10. Then he spread it before me and there was writing on the inside and the outside. Right? Writing on the inside and outside. And Arthur likes a little bit of originality, right? He wants to be original. Ezekiel didn't have any chance to be original. He had to do exactly what God said. He said, tell them, thus saith the Lord, said that it comes from uh, the very authority of the covenant-keeping, all-powerful God. Tell them that, and then you tell them exactly what I said, and I've written on the front, and I've crammed it all on the back, so that you can't add any words to it. You tell them exactly, just and only, what I've said. And your message before them will be lamentations, Mornings and woe. Nothing added to the preaching of woe. We have the grace and mercy of the Spirit. We have the grace and mercy of Christ. These people who have been rebellious for generations and generations, all they had coming for them for a long time was lamentations mornings and woe. And Ezekiel was not to turn from the right or the left or to add anything to it or take anything away from it. He was just supposed to preach it like God wrote it. And he was supposed to eat that word and take it inside of him. Remember when Jesus is there with Satan and says, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from my mouth. Here in this day of trouble, here in this time of crisis, here. And notice he's supposed to eat, he's supposed to go.
go inside of him. And that's, that's the picture we're getting in. It's the word of God inside of him so he can make a difference. If you read on in, in verse, in chapter 3, we find that it's both sweet and bitter. God's word is often like that. It will bring comfort. And yet, when we begin to apply it to our lives and other people's lives, it can cause them pain. The Word of God is not here for ice cream and cake. It is here for times of crisis and calamity. It is here for us to look at at these times when we have lost people and when people are being lost. It is here when we're having the economic upheavals and, and all the rebellions. It's here for God's people to grab a hold of and have encouragement and enlightenment and enablement from. The Word of God enlightens us to the plan of God, gives us a, a vision of God from cover to cover and even on the maps. We see God moving mildly where He pleases to move, doing what He pleases to do, and doing it when He pleases it to do it. Remember, we talked a little bit about Wednesday night about how God is a God of patience and how we're oftentimes uh, grateful that God is patient with us, but is uh, oftentimes upset that he's patient with others. We're living on a timetable. God is not. We're living by what we see, and God's living by what he already has planned and known. In this day and time, let us be the children of God who heed here in heat. And let us go out to a rebellious world and bring them the only hope, true patience and comfort and joy that this world has ever known. That is Jesus. Father, we are so grateful for this time together, so grateful for your love, so grateful for your purpose, your plan. Lord, please help us to understand our role in it. In Jesus' name I pray.